When making a 2D game, it's sometimes good to draw inspiration from games that you already play. If you're a subscriber to this channel, you might already know that I'm a big fan of both Super Mario World and Celeste. It's games like these that make me want to make my own side-scrolling platformer one day. In fact, recently I began development on an indie project and I want to share the techniques I learned so far. So this is part one of a four part series that breaks down how to create a perfect character controller in Unity. And at the end of the series, I hope that you can apply these techniques to your game so that your game has the same feel as some of the best games in the world. So without any further delay, today we're gonna to talk about sprites and animation. Now I consider myself to be a programmer and not an artist, but I've been able to get by with a few tricks. When it comes to animation, I just don't possess the talent required to visualize what needs to be drawn in my head. So instead I just keep it simple. By working with pixel art, it's a lot easier for me to make something that looks good because it involves a lot less detail. For example, an entire face can consist of anywhere between 4 and 10 pixel blocks. But even with pixel art, I struggle to recreate the smooth animations that are seen in some of these amazing games. So the biggest trick I've learned is to pull from what you know. If you google a character's name plus sprite sheet, you might get lucky and find a resource which shows you a frame by frame drawing of each of your favorite characters. For example, if I Google Super Mario World sprite sheet, I can very easily see frame by frame drawings of Mario. Now, hopefully this goes without saying that you shouldn't use or even trace this artwork for any commercial production, but it's okay to use this as a guide when you're first starting out. For me, I like to look at something to see where the legs and hands should be positioned when drawing out my animation. And once you have a nice guide, the next step is to start drawing. Personally, I like to use a software called A Sprite which you can play around with for free before purchasing. It won't let you save any of the files, but the full version only costs around $14, and personally, I feel like that is totally worth it. Although, if you don't have the money to spare, any art program would be fine. For now, I'm going to work in Photoshop to cover some of the basics. When you create a new document, you want to consider world dimensions. By this, I mean how does your character compare in size with the background and other elements in the scene. For my game, I use tiles to populate my scene, so I want my character to be about the same width as one of these tiles. If you're just starting out, I recommend making your character fit in the dimensions of one block wide and two blocks high. For pixel art, I recommend one block being 32 pixels, so a good starting canvas would be 32 pixels wide and 64 pixels high. In Photoshop and most art programs, you want to use a block style brush to draw your character. Since it takes me days and sometimes weeks to draw out a sprite sheet, I'm not going to show you that process here, but I'm going to open up a file I've used in the past to show you how you should set up the file. Right off the bat, it looks like my frames are sort of randomly placed, but there is structure to how I have it set up. For this file, I wanted my character to be 40 pixels wide by 80 pixels high. In Photoshop, you can set up a grid to see this more clearly by going to Preferences, and then Guides, Grids, and Slices. Then under grid, you want to change the value for grid line to equal one block size. So for this document that happens to be 40, and go ahead and set subdivision equal to one. Then go to view and then show and make sure grid is selected. This should now create grid lines for you to work within. My only additional note for this is to make sure your character is aligned to the bottom of each frame. This is so that when gravity is applied, your character is properly aligned to the ground. Now, the animation part is where I prefer to spend the $14 to buy a sprite. The first time I did this file, it was hard to visualize how my animation was coming along while I was drawing it. But with a sprite, they have a lot of cool tools to help you with this. The first one, and my personal favorite, is the onion skin tool, which allows you to see a sort of watermark of the previous frame as you draw over it. And my second favorite tool is the little preview window in the corner that lets you not only see an actual size version of your character, but allows you to preview your animation in real time while you are drawing. Lastly, it takes the hard work out of setting up your sprite sheet by offering you several different ways to export and save your files. So once you have drawn and completed your character sprite sheet, the next natural step is to import this into Unity. This can be accomplished by simply dragging the files into your project window. For my character sheet, I decided to break down each of my idle states into different files. I frankly did this for organization, but it's generally better practice for optimization to keep this all in one file. Once imported, be sure to highlight the file to open its settings in an inspector window. The first thing we want to do is adjust the pixels per unit value. This is equal to the amount of one block that we discussed earlier. For this character, I used a 16 pixel block as a canvas for my object, so my value here would be 16. If your character is 32 pixels wide by 64 pixels high, you would put 32 pixels here. For files with multiple frames on one sheet, you would want to change sprite mode to multiple, and then go ahead and click the sprite editor button. 
This opens a separate window that allows you to slice your file into multiple assets. Since we made each frame the same dimensions, I want to simply go to Slice and then change Type to Grid by Cell Size. Here, you'll want to enter a single frame's dimension. For me, this happens to be 16 by 18, and then go ahead and click Apply. And if you're working with pixel art, be sure to change Filter Mode to Point No Filter and set Compression to None. This makes sure your pixel art stays crisp at any resolution. Then in your project window, you should see your frames separated as individual game objects. So now I'm ready to turn these into animations. First, let's go to our scene view and create an empty game object. Let's label this player and reset the transform. Then let's create another empty game object inside this game object. This is going to act as an offset object when we program our jumping animation, which we will discuss later. Let's just label this character holder and then set the transform to be negative one for the Y value. And then lastly, let's create another game object inside this child object called character animation and let's set the transform to be positive one for the Y value. Again, it'll make sense later why we set it up this way. Once all that is created, we can now add a sprite renderer component to our character animation object. Then go ahead and open up your animation window by going to Window, Animation, and then select Animation. Then with that open, click the button that says Create. This will prompt you to save an animation file in your project. Be sure to label this to describe the current state you want to animate. Since I'm going to animate the running state, I'll just save this as running. Next, I want to expand my running frames and then just go ahead and drag them into the animation window. This immediately creates a frame by frame animation that you can preview by pressing the play button. To change the speed of the animation, you can reduce the sample rate to a number that works for you. I happen to like the number 14 for this animation. Then simply replicate this process for each one of your animation states by selecting this drop down and going to create new clip. Initially, I recommend you have three states, one for running and or walking, one for idle, and one for falling. For jumping, I found it better to squish our game object using local scale, but I'll explain the process for that in a future video. Once you have all three idle states set up, go ahead and open up your animator window by going to Window, Animation, and then select Animator. Here, you should see all three of your animation states. By default, you should make sure your idle state is set as Layer Default State. Then to transition between these different states, we want to set up animation parameters. If you click the plus symbol, you'll see a drop down of different parameters you can create. For now, I just want to create two floats, one called horizontal and one called vertical. These values can be used to track velocity or controller input. So for this example, I'm just going to use it to keep track of controller input. So let's go back to our player object and add a new C sharp script called character controller. Then up at the top, let's write public animator and let's just call this animator. Then in our update function, we can modify the values of our animator parameters by writing animator.setFloat. For the first parameter, we need to write the name of our parameter in quotations, so let's write horizontal, and the second parameter is the value we want to set this as. For example purposes, let's just set this to input.getAccess, and then put horizontal. Then let's do the same thing for vertical, but let's set the value to input.getAccess, and then vertical. Now if we save the script and go back into Unity, and then select our animator object in the inspector and press play, we should be able to see these values change in our animator window when we move the joystick around on our controller or if we press the arrow keys down on our keyboard. With that set up, we can then right click to create a transition between animation states. Simply drag the arrow to where you want to transition from. Once selected, you can visualize the transition in the inspector. If I highlight a transition, I am then able to set conditions about how I want this transition to occur. So to transition from an idle state to a running state, we want our horizontal to be greater than a value of say 0.5. Then to transition from running back to idle, we just repeat these steps, except this time let's set the value to less than 0.5. But since we want this to work in both directions, we actually want to adjust our horizontal value to equal the absolute value of our controller input. So let's go back to our script and wrap our code in a mathf.abs function. When we press play and then use our controller input, we should see our character go from an idle state back to a running state and vice versa. And then to trigger our falling animation, we just need to set up a transition from both running and idle where the condition is set so that our vertical value is less than zero. This would indicate we are moving in the downward direction. And that's basically it for this video. Stay tuned for next week where we take this character animation and program it to run around our scene like Mario.